السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Inshallah, today I want to share with you a topic that's also very close to my heart. Yesterday I talked to you about Ramadan and preparation for Ramadan, and today is actually a little bit of a different topic. I wanted to talk to you about the last ayat of Surah number 25, Surah Al-Furqan. And these ayat are, they describe a special group of people. What makes them special is Allah describes them as Ibad rahman This phrase you have to understand first. The slave of Allah, the, the one who accepts Allah as his master is called Abd. The plural of Abd, there are two of them. There's, there's Abid and there's Ibad. And some say that Ibad actually comes from Abid. Now when Allah uses the word Abid, Abid, this, this ayah does not say Abidur Rahman, it says Ibadur Rahman. It's a difference. Abid is used for all the slaves of Allah, the ones who believe and the ones who don't believe. All of them. Abid is all of Allah's slaves. Allah does not want to do wrong to all the slaves, any of the slaves. That's all of them. But ibad is special people. Ibad is special people. So already the ayat are beginning, letting you and me know that the people Allah will talk about in these ayat are special. But don't be depressed. When you hear that, you're like, oh, it's going to talk about special people, not me. So maybe my, I can go back to Facebook. No, no, hold on. But, and I'll explain why. Then he says, Ibadur Rahman. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal has so many names. You could say Ibadullah. You could say Ibadul Khaliq. He chose to say Ibadur Rahman. In the khutbah, for those of you who weren't sleeping, in the khutbah today, I was tell telling you some things about Ar Rahman. When Allah's love and mercy and care is extreme and it's immediate, I added temporary, but these two first, extreme and immediate. Then he uses Ar Rahman. And so Allah says, the slaves of Ar-Rahman, the good slaves, the special slaves of Allah, who get Allah's immediate and special mercy. These are the people Allah is describing in this passage. I would love to be in this group. You would love to be in this group. Because this is the group of people that Allah says, He goes out of His way to care for them. Out of His way to show them love. Who are these people? Now, we're going to read a lot of descriptions. But the beauty of all of these descriptions, I'm going to get a little bit technical with you, but I hope you can stay with me. All of the descriptions we're going to read, grammatically speaking, is not even a whole sentence. It's actually what you call in the Arabic language, a mubtada. What you call in the English language, the subject. The predicate isn't even mentioned until like 10 ayat later. It's 10 ayat later. And let me just, because I brought it up to you now, subject and predicate, mubtada and khabar, let me just make it easy for all of you. Those of you who don't understand what I'm saying, inshallah in two minutes you'll understand. In a sentence, there's the part before the is, and there's the part after the is. Ustad Nu'man is boring. There's the part before the is. What was the part before the is? Ustad Nu'man. What's the part after the is? Boring. There's two parts. Now the first part, whenever you say the first part, it is, doesn't tell you everything. 
It doesn't tell you everything. It makes you curious. The, the mubtada, the part before the is, is there to make you curious. And then once you become curious, the part after the is is there to tell you, let me tell you something about it. Let me give you some information. So the first part is there to make you curious. Like for example, if I say Qatar is, and I don't finish my sentence and I walk away. You're like, what? Tell me. What is Qatar? Hot. <laughs> right? Now what I'm saying to you is that there are going to be 10, 11 ayat, and they're all the part before the is. They're all the part before the is. He's not even the part after the is. So I'll end the curiosity right now or maybe I'll end it later. Maybe I'll end it later. What is after the is? That's at the end. We'll get to that. Now there's going to be a lot of descriptions of a group of special people called Ibadur Rahman. But, even if you read 10 descriptions, they are not one group with 10 descriptions. They are 10 groups with 10 descriptions. If I say about one person that he is strong, tall, knowledgeable, three qualities. Does he have all those qualities at the same time? Yes. All of them at the same time. But if I say these people are strong and these people are tall and these people are knowledgeable, I separated them, yes? And I separated them with an and. These ayat are important because Allah did not say all of these qualities belong to the same group. Allah loves special people and they belong to different groups. When you listen to these ayat tonight, you have to think about which group are you in? Which of these can you qualify for? Maybe you can qualify for more than one. And inshallah you qualify for one of them at least. Hopefully one of them. I gotta be in one of these. Because these people get special love and special care and special mercy from Allah. May Allah make us from them. Okay. Now having said all of that, the first kinds of people Allah loves وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا The special slaves of Ar-Rahman, the ones who walk around on the earth, they hang out, they go for a walk. I know you don't walk much outdoors here. So they're walking in the mall, they're walking at the airport, they're walking by the beach, they're taking a walk. And by the way, just because it says يَمْشُونَ, it doesn't just mean they're walking. يَعْنِي يَقُودُنَا سَيَّارَاتِهِمْ هَوْنًا they're driving their cars also, right? Whatever, however you're hanging out, you're outside in society, you have this element of humility, hawnan. You feel weak before Allah. You're humble in the way you walk, in the way you talk. Sometimes you don't have to be arrogant because you say something arrogant. In the way you look at someone, there's arrogance. In the way you carry yourself, there's arrogance. In the way you insult someone with your face. Two. It's arrogance. That's not yamshuna ala al-ardi hawnan. There are people that have, you have a good job. Maybe one of you works in a, one of those big towers over there that look all crazy, those big towers. You work over there and you're, you know, walking around and there's a guy who works, you know, in construction. He picks up bricks or cleans the street or something. And he gets too close to you and you're like, wait man, dirty. Dude, he, he's a Muslim. And on above it, even if he's not Muslim, he's a human being. Allah Azza wa Jal honored all children of Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. We honored all children of Adam. Who are you to look down on another human being? Allah says, people that are special to Allah, they have humility when they walk. يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا But then how do you know if you're humble? How can you check? Is there a litmus test? Yes, there is a test. And Allah gives us the test in the ayah. If you're asking yourself and I'm asking myself, am I humble? Or am I arrogant? How would I know? Well, here's the test. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When people who have no control over their emotions talk to them, when idiots talk to them, when obnoxious people talk to them, when arrogant people talk to them, when ignorant people talk to them, when angry people talk to them, when insulting people, disrespectful people talk to them, and somebody insults you, it hurts. When somebody talks to you badly, it hurts. But Allah calls all of those people jahilun. Jahil actually in Arabic is the opposite of aqil. Jahil means someone who has no control over their emotions. A bad word comes in their mind, it comes out of their mouth. They don't think about it. So you're driving in the streets of Qatar, and some guy cuts you off, and you honk your horn, and he stops his car, 
and he gets out of the car and he's at you and you're like oh yeah I'm gonna show you and you start responding back wait 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 hold on وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمْ مُجَاهِدُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Eh, سَلَامًا man. Salamu alaykum. Okay, sorry. You're right. I'm wrong. Go. Go. <laughs> you have to learn to do that. And if you can't do that, then you are disqualified from category number one. You want to be in category number one, and you will. Allah does not say if, if you see, if, if ignorant people talk to you, if you know, obnoxious people address you. Allah says when. I talked to you about the difference between if and when yesterday. When means it will happen. If means it might happen. Allah says it, there's, no, there's no possibility percentage it might happen to you, it might not happen to you. It will happen to you. It will happen to you. It happens to me all the time. All the time. I was at a masjid, not over here in America, I was at a masjid. And I was sitting in the, uh, talking to some board members about some program I wanted to do. And a brother walked in and he heard that I wanted to teach Arabic. He was an Arab fellow, he was an Egyptian fellow. And he heard that I wanted to teach Arabic. And I'm, he's like, you teach Arabic? And I was like, yeah, a little bit. And he said, where are you from? I was like, Pakistan. And he said, oh yeah? And he took out a napkin and he said, write the alphabet for me. So I wrote down the English alphabet for him. <laughs> and he said, you see, you don't know Arabic. I was like, yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he started teaching me the alphabet, 30 minutes. I sat there and I learned the alphabet with him. And then he had to go, and then he left. And that night, that night, at the same masjid, they asked me to give a lecture, the importance of learning Arabic. If you go on YouTube and you search how to learn Arabic and why learn Arabic, why study Arabic? That lecture was at that masjid. And that guy was in the first row, smiling at me the whole time. <laughs> but he comes to me and says, you, Pakistani, you're gonna teach Arabic? I'm gonna go, oh yeah? Well, sh sh no, 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 wait, wait. It's okay, it's all right. You're right, I don't know anything, it's okay. Don't get worked up. Don't get all full of yourself. If people speak to you in that way, it's okay, they have a right. You know, and, and you, you don't know why people speak to you in this way. There may be some other things going on in their life. You know, and they come to you and they let their anger out on you. You have to be kind of merciful and courteous to people. They were, they were women. They were men that came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and started yelling at him. From the Badu. They were Muslims. They started yelling at him. And you know, the Prophet sallallahu didn't get upset. He just calmed them down. The Sahaba would have killed them. He said, no, relax. Let him, just peace. You know? This is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When people say things that make you angry, you just gotta calm down. And by the way, guys, men over here, your wife will say a lot of things that make you angry, boy. Oh, ho, 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 ho. And when you hear that, you don't say that she's jahil, but you do say salam. Just be quiet. Don't talk back. Sisters upstairs, ladies, your husbands will say things that will boil your blood. Oh my God, you will get angry. And Allah has given you a special power. I have three sisters, I have a wife, and I have four daughters. I know girls have special powers. And their superpower is they can answer you in a way that will like stab you in the heart. Oh my God, they have the most amazing answers. They'll be like, ah! But you, sisters, when your husband is out of control and he's becoming too emotional or too angry, shh, salam. Change the subject. And salaman, qalu salaman does not mean that Allah says you have to say salaman, somebody's fighting, you're like, hey, salaman, salaman, salaman. <laughs> not like that. That's not what that means. Let me tell you what salaman, salaman could be a hal here in grammar. You know what that means? They speak calmly. They don't just say the word salam, they speak calmly. They speak peacefully. They speak in a way that disarms. That doesn't make you angry. You know? And so, for example, you know, one time I was sleeping in the masjid. I was, a, I was in the atikaf and I was sleeping in the masjid. And you know, when you're sleeping, you don't know which, you which way you turn. So I'm sleeping and I woke up because somebody kicked me in the stomach. There was a really old gentleman in our community. He was an Afghani fellow. 
And he was also making atikaf. He didn't speak any English, any Arabic. He just spoke Pashto only. And he kicked me in the stomach. And I wake up like, oh. And I look at him like. <laughs> and he goes, Quran. My back was towards the bookshelf, which the, where the masahib was. You can't have your back to the Quran, so he kicked me in the stomach. Now I could get up and say, come on, you could have woken me up nicely, or I'm fasting, and then you kicked me in the stomach too. And, but you know what I did? I just hung out with him afterwards. I just sat down with him. I said, can I read some Quran to you? You can correct my Quran. And we, we just spoke in sign language. And I recited Quran to him, and we just hung out the whole time. You have to deal with people peacefully. You have to calm down when you deal with people. You will meet all kinds of people. All kinds of temperaments. Some, some of you are stuck with a boss. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Like he's always angry. He wakes up angry. He, he, you know, he's eating and he's angry. Even, he's angry when he's smiling. Even when he's angry. You know? You have that kind of a boss. But you know what? You have to learn to deal with it peacefully. Peacefully. You have employees. You have, some of you are teachers. You have students that make you angry. You got to calm down. You can't get angry in the classroom. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is told, we were told, inni bu'ithtu mu'alliman. He says, I was sent as a teacher. He's sent as a teacher. He never got angry at people. Not necessarily, never. You know? His servant is telling us that he lived with him. And then he's, and he never told him, do why did you do this? Why didn't you do this? The entire time. SubhanAllah. And that's your slave. That's not even your employee. That's your slave. He never said this to them. So qalu salaman is really important. And why is it important? Because the next time you have to force yourself to be humble and calm things down and not respond in anger, then you tell yourself, I'm doing this because I want to be from ibadur rahman وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا This is category number one. Category number one. People who can control their anger. People who can control their pride. People who can let go of their ego and just diffuse a situation. Even if they're right. Even if they're right, they just say, it's okay, it's not worth it. It's not worth the fight. You know? Qalu salaman. I'll tell you an interesting story of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Imam Abu Hanifa, obviously, you know, a great faqih of his time, and then after, people are coming to him for fatwa all the time, and his mother had a question. And she asked a question, so she, he told her the answer, and she said, you don't know anything. So your mother can say that to you, right? I'm going to go ask that one over there. And that guy that she wanted to go ask, he was a da'i. He wasn't a alim, he was a da'i. Da'i means he can give people a reminder, he can tell people about taqwa, but he doesn't know about fiqh or sharia or anything like that. So his mother goes and asks him. And he says, let me do some research, I'll get back to you. And he comes back to who? <laughs> he was like, hey, your mom came over and she was like, she had a question. And he's like, okay, here's the answer, but don't tell her I told you. <laughs> right? Sometimes you will have people in your own family that don't like hearing from you. Maybe you became closer to the deen, but they're not that close to the deen. And that makes you angry. It makes you angry that some women in your family don't wear hijab. It makes you angry some young men in your family don't pray. You get mad at them. No, don't get angry at them. Speak with them peacefully. Speak with them calmly. Your anger will only take them further away from deen. They won't bring them closer. You know, you have to have a soft heart towards those who are not there yet. You were not praying five times a day. There was a time when you weren't like that. If somebody spoke to you angrily, would you start praying or go further away? Think about that. Think about that. Allah softened your heart. So you wait until Allah softens theirs. And you have to be soft to people. I remind people that... Allah Azza wa Jal told Musa alayhi salam to be nice to Fir'aun. To be nice to Fir'aun. Fir'aun tried to kill Musa alayhi salam when he was just a baby. Fir'aun killed thousands of babies every year. He called himself God. There are so many reasons to hate Fir'aun. And Allah says, when you go to him, وَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا If you have to be nice to Fir'aun, what about your wife? What about your husband? What about your children? What about your cousins, your brother, your uncle? These are the people that make us angry. These are the people. Family makes you really angry, I'm telling you. I know. Siblings make you angry. And these are the people that deserve the most soft responses from us. We have to change the way we, we behave with them. This is qalu salaman. Okay, this is category number one. Category number two. 
والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما and there's another group of people who are special to Allah they spend the entire night either in sajda or standing qiyamul layl tahajjud everybody's like okay next category i can't do this category I, this one's <laughs> You know what's amazing? If you say someone is really close to Allah, then you think this person must make the hajjud. And Allah in this passage says someone who's really close to Allah, first category is not the people of Qiyamul Layl. First category is who? People who control their anger. You see how much he loves? He loves the people who control their anger even more than the people that spend the whole night in prayer. Subhanallah. وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا Okay, give me the third category. He says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّ نَصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّا It's so beautiful, this, this category. There's a group of people Allah loves because the only thing, some, they just ask Allah, Ya Allah, just, I don't want to see Jahannam. I don't want to, take me away from Jahannam. I don't want to, I don't want to be turned away from it. إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا مُمُقَامًا Its penalty is very heavy. It's a huge panel. I can't bear it. I can't even think about Jahannam. It is a terrible place to be for a little while or for a long time. I have to explain this part to all of you. It is a terrible place to be mustaqarran for a little while wa muqaman long term. Now, there are some people, like I was, I, I, I'm sure you've seen this on YouTube if you follow my videos. There was a young girl in Florida at a youth program. She asked me a question. She wrote it down. She said, I do a lot of haram things. But I'm not going to hell forever, right? Because I'm Muslim. So even if I do go to hell, it will not be forever. This dua says, I don't want to go to Jahannam, not for a long time, not for a short time. I don't want to see it. Allah loves the people who understand that they don't want any part of Jahannam, short or long. There are some Muslims who say, of course, I don't want to go to Jahannam forever, but I don't know, one weekend, I, I, maybe we can do that much haram. <laughs> you know, this is from the Jews. Ayyama ma'dudat. They said, a few days, we can handle it. I mean, come on. You know, after that, it's like Jannah, man. It's okay. So then you party here, you pay one weekend price, and then you go back to Jannah. What's the big deal? Allah says, those are not Ibadur Rahman. Ibadur Rahman are the people, the special people to Allah, are the people who say, Ya Allah, I don't want to see Jahannam, not for a day, not for two days, not for a minute, not for a second, and not permanently. I don't want anything to do with Jahannam. I know it'll take a long time for me to explain this, but I, I want to take a minute or five minutes at least to explain this to you. There is an ayah in Surah Al-Anbiya. There's one ayah in Surah Al-Anbiya that describes the least punishment in Jahannam. Jahannam is described in so many places in the Qur'an, but the least, 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 I mean the easy punishment of Jahannam is described in Surah Al-Anbiya. How easy is it? The person described has not tasted the fire. They have only tasted a breeze. You know when you have a fire, it has a hot wind. The hot wind is called lafha with a lamb. But the ayah doesn't use lafha. It says, وَلَا إِمَّا سَتْهُمْ nafha with a noon. With a noon, it actually means a cool breeze, not a hot breeze. And nafha is used when, you know, when you close the door and some hot air comes in, as you're closing the door, that the air that comes in or goes out, that's called nafha. Allah says, those people will taste a nafha, air. Not even inside Jahannam, where? Outside, they haven't even gone in yet. And they didn't taste fire, they didn't taste lava, they didn't eat anything, they, they're just exposed to air. And not even hot air, which kind of air? Cold air, nafha. It's even, there's hotter air in, the, in Jahannam. And it touched them barely, masatum, it barely touched them. You know, sometimes you're boiling or frying things and something comes out and it touches you, just a little bit. But that's not air, that's liquid. Allah doesn't say air, liquid will touch you. What does He say? Air will touch you and it will barely touch you for a split second. Split second it will touch you. That's it. And it won't even be the full-fledged air, it will be not نَفْحَةُ عَذَابِ rabbik. It will be نَفْحَةٌ مِنْ عَذَابِ rabbik مِنْ لِلْتَقْلِيلِ It's to make it very little bit of air. It's just tiny little bit. So it's not even the whole door was opened and the wind came in. It was like a tiny little, you know how you have window inside the window? 
a little bit of it opened, and a little bit of an air came out, and you felt it on your skin, just for a split second. And then, this is the only torture this person received. There is nothing else yet. And they're not even in hell yet, they're still outside. That's evident from the word nafha. He says, Ya wailana. The person swears, I have never felt more torture ever in my life. This is the worst, I must be in the worst part of hell. Wail, the Rasul describes wail as the worst part of hellfire, so scary that hell itself is afraid of it. Jahannam is afraid of wail. And this guy says, I must be in wail. Ya wailana. He's not even inside yet. The Muslim understands, the believer, the student of Qur'an understands إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا I cannot be there for a little while and a long time, I know. I should not have the mentality of Bani Israel who said آه, لَن تَمَسَّنَا النَّارِ إِلَّا يَامَ مَعْدُودَاتِ Just a few days, we can handle it, you know. I've had long, hard, hot road trips outside with no air conditioning, I'm tough. No. إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا This is a category by itself. These people are special to Allah. The only thing they ask Allah is, Ya Allah, I don't want Jahannam. I don't want Jahannam. Never, at all. That dua itself qualifies you to be special to Allah. SubhanAllah. What a mercy from Allah. So now we have a few categories. People who control their anger. Category number two, people who... Then category number three, people who ask Allah, they don't want to go to hellfire. They can't pay the penalty of hellfire. Then what category? He says, Subhanallah, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا The people who spend money, when they spend money, they don't spend too much. And they're not cheap either. They're right in between. When you go shopping, you say, ah, I, I make good money. Put it all in. I'll take two of those. I'll take three of those. I'll take five of those. What's the biggest TV you have? I want a TV that doesn't even go through my door. <laughs> Give me that one. You know. <laughs> What's the most expensive car? What's the most, you know, you just want to show people how much money you got. You just want to pay, pay, pay. You can eat food at a restaurant, but you want to go to the restaurant where they charge you 200 riyals to sit down first. You're spending too much. Spending too much. Right? Allah says the people who spend, but they're responsible when they spend. They're responsible when they spend. And they're not cheap either. You don't go to the store with your wife to get the cereal and the milk and the vegetables and she's putting milk and you're like, you're gonna drink all that milk? You need all that milk? Get the small one. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't be cheap either. You have to have a balance in your budget. Let me tell you something. The economic crisis in the world, the fall of the European economy, the fall of the American economy that it's barely recovering from. You know where it came from? It came from people spending irresponsibly. And then institutions spending irresponsibly. And then governments spending irresponsibly. And saying we can just put it on the credit card, put it on the credit card, put it on the credit card. People got approved for mortgages for their homes far more than they can afford. And they said we're approved, go for it. You get, you get your credit check and you can lease a car. It's more expensive than you can afford, but hey, I, I'll just make the minimum payments. I'm okay. And people built upon this debt because they didn't spend. They spent outside of their means. Quran is teaching us. Quran is teaching us that when you spend money, don't spend money that's not in your pocket. Don't take loans. Don't be addicted to your credit card. Don't be like that. Spend within your means. Spend within your budget. You know? The only time the Muslim gets careful about spending is when they have to give sadaqah. That's the only time. The, you know, there's a, the, the, you know, the box is going around and people are collecting sadaqah for the masjid and you say, man, electricity bill, gas, school. There's so many, the whole budget for your family comes up in front of you. You become a certified professional accountant, <laughs> you know. But then when you go to the, the, the video game store or the electronic store, and you're buying the, the, new ga the new phone, the tablet, or you're buying the movie or whatever, the whole budget doesn't come in front of your eyes. You don't say, what about the gas? What about the electricity? You just spend it. You just spend it. We have to be responsible spenders. We can't be cheap and we can't overspend. A lot of you, mashallah, are doing well financially. So you say to yourself, I can afford it. Just because you can afford it doesn't mean you should spend the money. 
Your money has other uses. You can, you, you can help your family. You have a lot of family back home that's not doing well. You can help them. You have, you have a lot of community over here that's financially not very well off. You can help them. You can help keep people get out of debt. Your money can do other good things. Instead of just buying yourself things, you know? You don't have to get the newest car. You don't have to. Just get a decent car. I'm not saying get a car that, you know, it's like, you know, the, uh, might as well get a donkey instead of a car. But <laughs> no, don't get that kind of car either. Get a decent car. But you don't have to get like all blinged out like a 350Z with like spinner rims and like, you know, neon lights. You know, like slow down when you drive by and chill out, dude. Just get a normal car. You know, don't go crazy. Don't, oh, don't pay five times the price to buy the same kind of shirt because it has the logo on it. You know, it has the brand on it. Come on, man, they were made in the same factory. They're playing with you. They're messing with you. If you think that you're, you get some more value when you wear a different brand. Don't be duped by these things, you know. Be reasonable. You don't have, people, you know, the people like to buy at expensive stores and they like to carry the bag from the expensive store and they like to wave it extra more. So people are like, oh, that store, okay, yeah, yeah, this guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They maintain a healthy, normal, responsible budget in between. And we have to teach this to our kids. We have to teach this to our kids. Don't just give your kids money. Baba, can I have 20 riyal? Nobody even asks for 20. They probably ask for 100 nowadays, right? What is a 20? Look at 20 like. What is that? You know, I can wipe my nose with 20. Give me some real money. But I'm saying, when you give your children money, Make them work. Make, make them earn money. Don't just give it to them. When you just give children money, they have no value for money. They have no value for it. When you say you will wash the car, you will vacuum the whole house, you will do this or that. If you, you know, don't have work outside, work inside the house. But work, serious work, and then I'll give you something. Then I'll, you'll earn it. You'll do all the dishes for this week, and then I'll give you something. And even if you give them two dollars, two riyals, five riyals, ten riyals, they will value it. If you just give it to them, you ask them the next day, where's the money? Uh, what money? What are you talking about? They spend it like that. Because they have no value for it. I had a very wealthy friend in America whose son memorized Quran. So he was so happy with his son, he bought him a BMW. Okay? And then M3. That's a serious car, guys. That, you know, I've sat in an M3 before and I've, I remembered Malakul Maut because the guy driving it went <laughs> like, he went 160 miles, not kilometers, miles an hour. That's insane. You know, speed of light. And this 16, 17 year old driving an M3 and he like got into three, four accidents, destroyed the car. Destroyed the car. Father says, he's a wealthy guy, you know, he's a surgeon, he buys him a Lexus, destroys it again. And he says, he came to me and said, what should I do? I keep, my son keeps destroying cars. Like, why do you keep giving it to him? Tell him, I am not buying you a car. Go get a job. Earn your money. So he works at a tire shop. He, his father is a surgeon, but he works at a tire shop. He works at a clothing store. He goes and does all kinds of, he mows lawns for people. He earns the little bit of money. And then what does he do? He, pay, he buys this $1,500 really bad car. But he washes it every day. He takes care of it. And he's so proud of it. Hey, sisters, sisters. Hey. What just happened upstairs? Who's fighting? Just end the fight right now and let's come back to the doves. Okay? I know it's hard. I know. No, you don't want to do that? I still hear you. Yeah, you. Stop it. Okay. Sisters, let me tell you a little secret to how you get people to stop talking. You stare at them the way you stare at your husband when he forgot to get the groceries. <laughs> okay? You don't have to say anything. Just stare at them with that look of death that you have mastered. And they will be quiet within 10 seconds. Okay? It always works. Okay. Anyhow. So spending responsibly. What's the next category? It's so beautiful. Somebody says, man, Ustad Norman, you gave us these categories, but I don't know. First category was control my anger. I'm like the Hulk, Ustad. I can't control my anger. Forget that one. Next category, Qiyam al-Layl. Like, oh, forget that. I, I don't even do Qiyam al-Nahar. I have Qiyam al-Layl. 
forget that, I can't do that one, give me the next one. Or they make a lot of dua to ask Allah for it. No, I can't remember dua, I'm busy right now. I, give me the next category. I'll say, okay, you spend responsibly. No, Stav, Grand Theft Auto just came out. You know, I, I can't spend responsibly right now. Tell me in Ramadan, not right now. Give me the next category. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. Those who don't call anyone other than Allah as a God. He opened the door to all Muslims, man. He opened the door to all... You are special to me if you don't call on anyone other than Allah. Subhanallah. And then he said, there's a couple other things. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسِ أَلَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ They don't kill anyone. You're like, at least I checked that guy. I didn't kill anybody. I'm good. I must be special to Allah because I haven't killed anyone. And you wonder, why would Allah put that here? Allah was talking about high expectations. Anger control, qiyamun layl, responsible spending, dua. These are special qualities. What's so special about not killing someone? Somebody's like, phew, I at least made that category. Wala yaznun, and they don't commit zina. Big, big sins, right? Why did he mention that? I believe he mentioned that because for some people in the world, these things are difficult. There are some people whose whole family is mushrik. They're the only one on Tawheed. And for them to only worship Allah is very hard, but they still do it. They still do it. They're special to Allah. There are cities and states and countries where wars are going on. People are killing each other. And it's very easy to join in and just kill somebody. And they say, no, I will not kill an innocent person. I won't do it. Even though it's really hard. It's really hard for them to stop. Everybody else is doing it. There are places in America where there are gangs. Cities that have gangs. And this kid lives in the neighborhood. If you don't join the gang, either you're with them or you're against them. So if you're with them, you go kill other people. If you're against them, they'll kill you. And he refuses to kill people. He's risking his life. That's special to Allah. He says, وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And they don't commit zina. They don't have boyfriends and girlfriends. They don't have secret relationships. Why did he mention that? Because for some people it's always there. He's a good looking young guy. He walks around in the mall and the girl looks at him and goes, hee hee. <laughs> and he's like, oh, this is easy. You know, nobody's watching. I think it's okay. Should be all right. And he stops himself. He still stops. It's hard. I know it's hard, guys. I know. It's hard. But you stop yourself. The girl thinks that guy's looking at me, man. He must think I'm really pretty. And she starts smiling. She stops herself. No, this is wrong. I can't do this. This is not right. Just because my parents aren't watching. Just because the police isn't here to stop me. Doesn't mean it's okay. Walaya is noon. They don't do it. They don't behave like that. There are young men in, like when I, where I come from in the US, obviously, you know, kids go to college, and college in the summer is bad. You know? It's bad. And you have an 18, 19 year old boy whose hormones are raging inside of him. And then there's like, in his college classroom, there's girls sitting that are barely dressed. And this girl comes over to him and says, hey, can you help me with the homework? <laughs> and he's being tested by Allah. He's being tested. You guys are going to be tested. That's not just in America, by the way. That's not just in America. You'll be tested in the mall. You'll be tested when you go out and hang out. I know. I know. Who told you? I, I, don't worry about it. I, I, I have big ears, alhamdulillah. You, you will be tested with this. And it's, sometimes it's not going to be easy, especially for the young people here. It's not going to be easy. Maybe you have friends on your phone, man. Your parents don't know about it. You got a secret. You got another profile on Facebook. You're just updating it right now. And you have to unfriend all of those girls. Yep. You do. You listening? You have to unfriend them. And don't call them back. And don't text them back. And when they say, what happened? You don't like me anymore. You don't even say, no, 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 no. It's not you. It's just Islam. No, don't do that. Don't even talk back. Just leave it. Drop it. End of story. No more. Girls, if you're up to this, stop it. You stop yourselves. You know, you, this is not something your parents will come in control. You, when you are teenagers and you have hormones and you reach the age of puberty and you're attracted to the opposite gender, that means in Islam you are adults and you have to make your own responsible decisions. Your parents are no longer responsible for your Islam. You are responsible. If you are 14 years old, 15 years old, even 13 years old, and you die today, then Allah will not say minor. 
Go easy on him. You are treated as an adult in our deen. This religion makes you an adult early. The moment you start feeling a little funny about the other gender, you're an adult. You will be tried by Allah like a 50-year-old, like a 30-year-old. You're the same as them. Hold yourself to a higher standard. Don't think of yourself as just a kid. You are an adult. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَى أَثَامًا Whoever did that, he's, he's, gonna, he's earned, he's come to contact with a great sin. How can a Muslim do this? How can a Muslim do shit? How can a Muslim kill someone? How can a Muslim commit zina? How can they do that? يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ the punishment will be doubled for those people. The, pa the passage began, these are special people to me. And now Allah says, these kabair, these three things, shirk, murder, and zina, adultery, illegitimate relations, these three things, if a Muslim does it, anybody else does it, they will get punished. A Muslim does it, I'll punish him double. He knew it and he still did it. The mushrik, at least he didn't know and he did it. The Muslim knew it and he still did it. On Judgment Day, on Resurrection Day, the punishment is doubled for him. وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ muhanan, And he will remain in that punishment humiliated. He will constantly be humiliated. Because shirk and killing a person and zina are humiliating crimes. They take away the dignity of a human being. And so Allah Azza wa is extremely angry at these people. Then you're like, maybe somebody sitting in this audience that's made some mistakes in their life. Don't raise your hand. Only Allah knows your mistakes. I don't want to know. And you shouldn't tell people. It's between you and Allah. Maybe you've made some big mistakes in your life. What about you? You hear these ayahs are like, oh my God, double punishment. Maybe I should leave the masjid right now because that's pretty depressing. And then shaitan comes to those kinds of people. You know what shaitan says to them? Man, you going to hell anyway. Might as well party it up. You know, what are you doing in the masjid anymore? You're, you're already on the express train. Just go all the way, man. You know, you're already a goner. What does Allah say about these people? إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا The exception is people who did shirk, people who did murder, people who did zina. But the exception is even if you did these things, these three things are all of these things, if you turn back to Allah, and you became a believer again. It's like you came, became a new Muslim. And you came into Islam all over again. And this time, وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And he was very serious about doing good things from now on. It's not just عَمِلَ صَالِحًا يَقُولَ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا نُسَمِّي هَذَا الْمَفْعُولَ الْمُطْلَقِ This is called the absolute additive. It's added to the verb to emphasize it over anything else. What that means in simple English is, this person came back, to, returned back to Allah, fixed their faith, and then after fixing their faith, this time they take their actions very seriously. They take their actions very, very seriously. They are really keen on doing good deeds. Amila amalan salihan. If you can become that person, even if you've done some terrible things in your life, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Then those people, Allah will take all of their sins and convert them into good deeds. He will not just get rid of your sins. We want Allah to get rid of our sins. Maybe your sins are the size of a mountain. I don't want to see that mountain on judgment day. Allah will not get rid of the mountain. Allah will turn the mountain into a mountain of good deeds. If you can make tawbah. This is ar-Rahman. Allah is telling us the people that are furthest from Allah. You know the Rasul ﷺ told us, لا يزن الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن the one who commits zina is not a Muslim, or not a believer at the time he's doing zina. He's not a believer. The people furthest from Allah, the people who lost their iman. The people who do shirk. The people who kill another person, an innocent person. The people who commit zina, they're furthest from Allah. And Allah says, even if they are so far away from me, they turn back towards me, I will forget all of their crimes, and I will convert their crimes into good deeds for them on judgment day. SubhanAllah. I will make them ibadur rahman to me. Because they came back. They were so far away and they still came back to me. That's what Allah wants. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Allah has always been extremely forgiving, always loving. Now somebody, shaitan comes to them as they're listening to this dars, and shaitan comes to them and says, Hey look, if you do a really bad sin, and then you make tawbah, you can take the mountain of bad deed and turn it into a mountain of good deed. So why don't we just go out there and do some really bad stuff, and then make tawbah, 
Because, man, that's the easiest way to get a huge pile of good deeds. <laughs> and somebody else is thinking, sitting there, man, these people were so messed up. And they made tawbah. And Allah gave them so much. But I didn't, I'm not that bad. I just missed a couple of salahs. I got angry at my mom once. You know, I talked back to my husband. And I said some mean things to my sister. And, you know, I, I talked back to my father, my mother, etc. I have some issues. I've done some bad things, but it's not that bad. I didn't kill anyone. I didn't do zina. So is my tawbah any good? I mean, their tawbah is, they did big things and they made tawbah. Is, but my tawbah is for smaller things. So does it count? Is it any good? Allah says in the next ayah, وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِنَ صَالِحًا Anybody else who makes tawbah and does any good deeds, فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ That's a pretty good tawbah too. He's also coming back to Allah with a very serious tawbah. In other words, you don't say, man, I haven't been really bad. So my tawbah is not as good as the guy who's, you know, who's a gangster, he like killed 20 people and then he became a Muslim and then he made tawbah. No, 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 no. Whatever sins you've made, whatever sins you've made, remember one thing about sins. If they, are a, if they are no big deal to you, if your sins are no big deal to you, then they are a big deal to Allah. And when your sins are a big deal to you, they're a big problem for you, then they are a small problem for Allah. Allah will forgive them easily if you care a lot about your mistakes. If you don't care about your mistakes, it could be a small mistake, but it will be very big on judgment day. Because you didn't care. Caring comes in the heart. Allah Azza wa Jalla judges what is, what is in our hearts, our attitudes. So, وَمَن تَابَ وَعَمِنَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ Okay. So we have a few categories. These are all special people. What's the next category? There's so many ways to get into Jannah. So many ways to be Ibadur Rahman. And by the way, this is the part before the is. Remember that? We're still before the is. We haven't reached the end. So what's the next category? He says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ Young people, please listen carefully. These are people, they, they never witness useless company. Zur means false testimony. It also means company that is useless, doesn't have benefit. It's batil. In other words, they don't hang out until 2 in the morning smoking hookah. They don't hang out till 3 in the morning just talking nonsense. They don't do that. They don't hang out with their friends and you know what they do at the mall. They don't do that. They don't get together and watch movies for hours and hours and hours. Why not? Because they've already made tawbah. And when someone makes tawbah, they know, you know when you, go, when you do big sins, you know how you get to big sins? You start with small sins. And then they get bigger and bigger and then you get into the big sins. Then you realize that your sins were a result of your friends. The people you spend time with. They were the one that gets you, makes it easy for you to do bad things. So Allah says now that they have made tawbah, they make sure they are never sitting in a gathering of evil. They're never sitting in a gathering of falsehood. Sometimes you get invited to a party. And maybe those people that invited you are not very religious. So they're blasting the music, women have makeup on, their men and women are mixed together, and you're in the middle of this party. What are you supposed to, it's your, your uncle. It's your cousin's party, you're like, you don't stand up and say, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورَ And then walk out. But you make an excuse. I have to get going. Inshallah, I gotta get going. Or you, you mashallah, you live in a country where the adhan can be heard anywhere. Right? So hopefully you get there, for 10 minutes you were in that gathering because it's family, you gotta go. Then you heard the adhan and say, hey, it's the adhan, I'll be right back. And then you go and you pray maghrib and you hang out until isha. Pray isha, then come back to the party and say, everybody's already left. And like, oh yeah, sorry. You can do that. You, but you, ha you don't embarrass those people. You don't embarrass them, but you don't participate either. You find a smart way to get out of it. So Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا When they pass by useless conversation, when they pass by a useless activity, when they're exposed to it, and they will be, then they leave it in a dignified way. They don't just make a scene. They don't just, I, you know, there's some funny stories in my life. When I was a college student, there were a bunch of guys in our college, Muslim guys, they used to play cards. Outside the musalla, the, the, our college in Queens College, we had a musalla, and outside the musalla, a student room, the, the students used to get together and they play cards. 
Now they're inside the student room, there's some people making salat. And outside these guys are playing cards. So this guy came out, he was like, you, you people, why are you playing cards? You should be making salat inside. And this one guy looks at him and goes, go grow a beard man, leave me alone. <laughs> why, did he do, why did he insult him like that? Why? Because when you see people doing useless things, you cannot get angry at them. You have to leave them in a dignified way. If you're going to give them advice, give it in a respectful way. Respect people even if they're doing wrong things. We have a hatred for sins, not for people who do them. We don't hate people who make mistakes. We hate the sin itself. So, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا Some of you have friends that have bad habits, and they invite you. Some of you have friends that do drugs. I know. And you know about it. Sometimes they've even offered it to you. And you're like, no. No. Not only should you try to stop them from doing it, if you have friends like that, get away. One thing you should do is try to get them out of it. And if you can't, you should distance yourself. Save yourself. You are not going to go save them, you'll get messed up with them. You have friends that, you have some friends that drink. They don't care. They drink. You know? And it, obviously it's haram, but when some people do haram a lot, then in their mind it's not that haram anymore. It becomes no big deal. You know, they say in Arabic, Kabbir ha takbur, sakhir ha tasghur. You make a big deal out of something, it's a big deal. It's not, you don't, you minimize it, it's minimal to you. It's not that big deal to you. It's not, a, it's not that bad, you know? So you have friends like that. You have to try to advise them, and if they don't change their ways, you cannot be in their company. You have to distance yourself. Marru kiraman. They walk away in a dignified way. Now we're coming towards the end, subhanAllah. Walladheena idha. This is the next category. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ Let me tell you, this next category could be all of you that are sitting over here right now. All of you. You have an opportunity to belong to this category. Well, and myself included. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا When they are reminded of the ayat of their master, I am being reminded, when I am speaking, I am being reminded of the ayat of my master. And you sitting here are being reminded of the ayat of your master. Allah says, when they are being reminded of the ayat of their master, لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا They didn't pass over those ayat, they didn't trip over them, mute, deaf and blind. They didn't just go over them like, oh, I didn't, you know, it's a nice speech, but I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. You know? My teacher used to call it in Urdu, Sun Sun Ke Sunni Ho Gain. Right? These people listen and they listen and they, nothing changes. You've been listening to speeches your whole life. What has changed? Allah says, you want to be Ibadur Rahman? You listen to a podcast, you listen to an MP3, you listen to a YouTube video, you listen to a dust like this sitting over here, and when you walk out of here, you say, I will not forget these lessons. These are lessons for my life. It's not just a speech and a program. This is not just a program. This is reminding myself of the ayat of my Rabb. What he told me to do. So I will become, I have to become one of these people. لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ This is the dua of this ummah today. Let me tell you something guys. I've traveled not that much, but I've traveled enough. I've seen enough of the ummah to be able to make some observations. The crisis of the ummah is not economics. It's not politics, it's not education, it's not corruption. That is not the crisis of the ummah. The crisis of the ummah is that the family unit is being destroyed. People don't know how to raise their kids anymore. People don't know what it means to be parents anymore. Husbands don't know what, to, what it means to be a husband anymore. Wife doesn't know what it means to be a wife anymore. Children don't know what it means to be children anymore. That is being destroyed by the modern co context we live in. And when, when we learn this dua, we learn that one of the, the, the things that will protect us, will save us, save our ummah, is that we protect our family. We protect that unit. The biggest priority the parents in this room have, the biggest priority you have is the Islam of your children. What will they do when you're gone? Are they only making salat because you're standing over there? Or are they making salat because you've been able to put the taqwa of Allah in their hearts? Yaqub alayhi salam is dying. He's dying. And he looks at his children and says, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن بَعْدِي أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءِ اِذْ حَضَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن بَعْدِي 
He's dying and he looks at his children and says, what are you going to worship after I'm gone? While I was here, you used to pray. You used to worship Allah, you used to make dua to him. But I'm leaving. What are you going to do after I'm gone? What are you going to do? That's tarbiyah. This dua, our master give us the gift. Hablana, give us the gift. Not atina, not a'tina. Right? It's hablana, from hiba. From hiba. And hiba in Arabic means a gift that you didn't expect. Ya Allah, give us the unexpected, undeserved gift. What gift? Min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun. From our wives and our husbands and our children, give us what makes our eyes so happy that it makes us cry. Qurrata a'yun. It cools our eyes. You know what that means? It makes you so happy you want to cry. When you listen to your child recite Qur'an, and they love reciting Qur'an, then it makes you so happy you want to cry. When you look at your wife and what, how she's raising your children, it makes you so happy you want to cry. When she looks at the husband who wakes up her, her children for fajr, his children for Fajr and takes them to the masjid, she wants to cry. She's so happy. Our husbands cry and our wives cry, but they don't cry because they're happy. <laughs> they cry for other reasons. You know, we are asking Allah for tears of joy. We want to be so happy with our family. How are we going to do that? Right now, every day you go home, you fight with your wife, man. Every day you go home. She's like, why were you so late? Why are you asking me? You always ask me. Don't you know there's traffic? Look outside the window. And you start every day, every day. And then you're so angry, then you look at the child and he's like, what are you, why are you playing with a toy? Why do you look happy? We don't have happiness here. Where's your homework? And the kid's like, I, I didn't get any homework. You know? Why not? I'm going to complain to your school. You know, God, this is not qurrata a'yun. There are people who come to the masjid for salat, and salat is supposed to make you give you peace. It's supposed to make you calm. It's supposed to settle you down. And then they go home, and there's a tornado that walked into the house. Oh, children or children hide under the bed. You know, the wife gets off the phone. She's like, you know, you cannot be the reason for your family to be afraid of you. You should be a reason for your family to be joyed, overjoyed. Your children should love, or they should run to you and hug you when you come home. That's the relationship you should have with your children. And while I'm on this topic, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, parenting was different. Now it's not the same. You cannot afford to be, I'm talking to the fathers here, you cannot afford to be authorities over your children. You cannot afford that. You have to be friends and authorities with your children. Our fathers were not friends with us. They were authorities. We didn't like slap our dad on the back and say, Hey dad, let's go play some basketball. Let's play some football. We didn't do that. Abba came on, Baba. Abba Jan, you sit straight. Assalamu alaikum. You get their shoes. That was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Your kids don't do that. And they won't. You, we're living in 2013, brothers and sisters. We have to accept reality. Our children are exposed to a lot of things. It doesn't matter if you're in the Muslim world or anywhere else. Ihtiram will remain. You have to respect your parents. But our children, we have to... The only one who will give them the love of Islam is you. And you will not be able to give it to them if you're only an authority. If you only yell at them and tell them what to do. But you're not their friend. Every father here should know and master the video games your children play. You should be better at, if you're letting your kids play video games, first of all, that's a problem. But if you are letting them play and you're not going to let them stop, then you better play with them. Then you better be sitting there playing with them. You don't go watch the news. You're not going to change the world. Okay? <laughs> You've watched enough news, believe me, and nothing has changed. You need to know, what the, what, you know whether the stock market went up or down. You don't even care about stocks, man. You, why are you watching the news? It has nothing to do with you. Listen to it in the car. When you're in the car. Don't come home and watch TV. Don't come home and watch the news. Come home and play with your kids. Do homework with your kids. Talk to your kids. Take your kids to the masjid. Do that with them. Make your kids love you. I tell you, I'm, I'm telling you, if we don't, if the fathers, if the fathers don't do this, we will lose this ummah. We will lose our next generation. I am telling you. I'm guaranteeing you. 
This is the real problem. The, the, I cannot come from America. Sheikh Mufti Min, can, Mufti Min cannot come from, you know, uh, all of different places in the world. And they come and they sit here and they give you a dars. We can only help a little bit. We can only help a little bit. The real change that will come in your child's life will come from you. Will come from you. رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنَ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنَ And now let me talk to the sisters for a little bit. Sisters, you're stuck with your husband. Stop being angry. Accept it. And try to love your husband. Try to make your husband happy. Because believe me, if he gets even a little bit happy, you will be really happy. I'm telling you, right now you say, I'm angry, why should he be happy? I know you, I know. I've talked to enough of you, I know. He, he doesn't care about me, why should I care about him? And he thinks the same thing. She doesn't care about me, why should I care about her? You start. You be nice to him. You smile at him and he'll get, he'll get all shocked. Like, why are you smiling? <laughs> Who, wh what? Is everything okay? <laughs> you know? Is your, is your mother here? Is that why? You know? <laughs> you know? Uh-uh. You have to be nice to your husband. You have to, don't dress up when you go to a wedding. Dress up for your husband. Even if you have four kids, it doesn't matter. Dress up for your husband. There's enough shaitan and fitna outside. So your husband should find beauty in you, not anywhere else. You, sh you should, and you should, be co you should compliment your wife. You should say nice things to your wife. You shouldn't just always complain, where are the keys, where's the mail? Did you get the, did you get the groceries? Did you do this? Did you, oh, you didn't do anything. Oh, you don't listen to me. Stop, man. There's not enough salt. There's too much salt. There's not enough sugar. There's too much sugar. There's not hot enough. It's too hot. Stop. Stop. Say nice things to your wife. And I know if you're like Indian Pakistani, then it's very difficult for you. <laughs> I know. It's very hard to say nice things to your wife. In, in our culture, if you say nice things to your wife, your ribs hurt. Like, ah. <laughs> You know, so you have to immediately follow it up with something mean. You have to say something bad right after to balance the equation. You can't just say nice things. So if the food is really good, you're like, oh, but I still hate your mother. It's like something. You have to, <laughs> you have to add something. <laughs> you know. But don't try to be, this is the dua. We are asking Allah to give us so much happiness from our wife and our husband and our children that it makes us want to cry out of joy. How will that happen? You cannot ask Allah for something and not make any effort yourself. It doesn't work that way. You cannot say, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as salati. Ya Allah, make me establisher of the prayer. And you're sitting, lying down in bed, adhan's going on, you're like, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as salati. <laughs> It's not, Allah is not going to send you angels that carry you and lift you to the salat and then they make you make ruku and get you back up. <laughs> you got to get up yourself, man. You make dua and you make some effort yourself. You're not going to make dua and all of a sudden your wife will start loving you. No, you have to show her love too. You have to do that. You have to make some effort in the house. I am telling you, this is the work of the ummah today. Fixing the family. Fixing the family. And when our children see that the husband and wife are fighting with each other, they slip through the cracks. So they get in trouble with the mother, they run to the father. When they get in trouble with the father, they run to the mother. And they know they can do whatever they want that way. Because they know father and mother don't like each other. When father and mother are a team, oh man, then they got nowhere to go. You, went to, you go to mom, mom's like, okay, hold on, let me call your dad. Let's talk about this together. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I was hoping we could discuss this by ourselves without getting father involved. No, no, no. You know? This is hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata ayun. And why should we do this? Why should I care so much about raising a good family, being a good husband? Wallahi, when you're a good husband, your son will be a good husband. When you're a good wife, your daughter will be a good wife. Sisters. This is what's good. And if you're not, then you will create bad families down in the future. And you will be the fault. You will be the reason. So we say, وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama." Make us imam, make us leaders over people that have taqwa. In other words, everybody who has a household is an imam. You have an imam of the masjid. You have an imam of you know, the, the musalla. But every house has an imam. You're the imam of your house. I don't care if you have a beard or not. You're the imam of your house. I don't care if you memorize Quran or not. You're the imam of your house. And you want to make sure that your household, 
that you are imam over these people are muttaqeen. The last thing I want to share with you about these requirements is why? Why did Allah say, وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama On judgment day, when I stand in front of Allah as an imam over my six children and my wife, when I am imam over them, they will be tied to me. And if I didn't do my job with them, and they made mistakes because of me, their mistakes will also cost me. I will be dragged down with them. But if I raise my children correctly, and I did good with them, and they went on to serve Allah's deen, and become good people, earn good deeds, then Allah raises them. And when He raises them automatically, because I'm chained to them, He raises me. We ask Allah to be with Imam over Muttaqeen. Because we, we ask that because we need it on Judgment Day. My deeds are not enough. I'm going to need commission from my children and their children and their children and their children. I tell you something. Where I, you know, I'm originally from Pakistan. And I come from a family and an like a extended family that's not very religious. We're not like super religious. I, I wasn't raised religiously really. And we made some salat here and there, but overall we're not that. You know, and the, most Pakistani families are like that. There are some that are religious, but most of them, in our circle at least, were not like that, right? And you know what? They were really, like, you know, when I started learning more about the religion, my cousins and other family members were kind of a little bit in shock. They were a little bit taken back. Well, why are you growing a beard? We don't do that. You know, why is your wife wearing hijab and niqab and all of that? Why is she doing that? You know, why, do you, why can't you be regular? <laughs> why can't you be normal, they said. Right? Because normally, we, you know, women don't wear hijab and it's all good. And the men are the way they are and salat if once in a while is fine. No big deal. You go to a wedding by Asr time, Maghrib, Isha go by, nobody cares. Songs are playing, it's no, no problem. Right? And so they say, you are leaving the tradition. Why aren't you like us? Why do you want to be like the Malvi Sahab? Why do you want to be, I'm a really strange Malvi Sahab I know, I'm wearing a suit. I know. It's, it's weird, it's confusing to you, I understand. I'll explain it to you one day, I'll come back and explain it to you. But, but for now, let me tell you something. Look back two generations ago. Look at the picture of your great-grandfather and his wife. They barely had black and white photographs back then. What a, guess what? Grandpa's got a big old beard and grandma's got, you don't even see her face. That's our tradition. Someone in this lineage decided that they will not take the deen seriously. And then their children decided not to take it. They take it even less seriously. And their children take it even less seriously. Until you get to a point where they're not even Muslim. I met a, I met a fellow. When I, was in, I was at a Quran conference in Las Vegas. I swear, it was a Quran conference. Okay? <laughs> so I was there at a Quran conference. And I met this really old white couple. You know, they're in their 90s. Blonde hair, blue eyes, they came into the masjid. And I said, what are you doing here? He goes, well, we just became Muslim last year. And we decided that we want to meet as many Muslims as we can before we die. So we go stop at every masjid in America. And we started in Ohio and now we've made it to Vegas. And we're going to go on to California and so on. And I was like, why did you become Muslim? A 91-year-old man and woman become Muslim. He said, I was looking up my family tree. And I realized that we're actually of Lebanese origin. And my great-grandfather who moved to America was actually a Muslim. But then his son, my grandfather, married a Christian. And then the children were raised pretty much between the two religions. And then they, they, they ended up choosing Christianity. And then we were raised Christians. And I, I've been raised a Christian. My children were Christian. But when I looked back at my lineage, I said, how was my great-grandfather Muslim? What is Islam anyway? I started reading it and I came back to Islam. Subhanallah, subhanallah, <laughs> you know, but how many people lose their religion? How many people? And you don't have to become a Christian or a Jew or an atheist to lose your religion. Isn't it enough that we're not even praying anymore? Isn't it enough that our children aren't even praying anymore? Allah says in Quran, فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى He didn't confirm the truth and the proof is he didn't pray. Accepting the truth of Islam, the proof of that is what? You pray. You don't pray, that means you don't really think it's the truth. فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى He lied, he called it a lie and he turned away from it. يعني في الآية تَوَلَّى عَنِ الصَّلَاةِ He turned away from the prayer, you know. So now, these are the qualities of 
Ibadur Rahman. But this is all one part of the sentence. What is the conclusion? What is Allah giving these people? He says, Ula'ika yujzawun al ghurfata bima sabaru. The slaves of Allah who control their anger and also those who pray in the middle of the night and also those who make dua to be saved from Jahannam and also those who are financially responsible and also and also and also and also what about them? they are the ones that Allah will be giving them they will be compensated with very high lofty mansions they will be given palaces because of the sabr they had because of the patience they had what is Allah telling us? all of these qualities require what? sabr what does sabr mean? Sabr doesn't just mean patience, it means constancy. Let me tell you what constancy is because Ramadan is coming. Some people become very good Muslims in Ramadan, but they don't have the sabr to continue after Ramadan. You can have these good qualities, you can control your anger, but you say, I controlled it for like two months. I ran out of gas. And I went back to normal again. No. No. Sabr means when you take one of these qualities, it's for life. If you're able to make that a lifestyle choice, then these people get Jannah. بِمَا صَبَرُوا وَيُلَقَّوْنَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَسَلَامًا And they're going to be greeted. They're walking into Jannah and the angels are waiting there. And they're walking in, they're calling your name. Hey, Asalaamu Alaikum. So happy you're here. Congratulations. This is your palace. It has all of these entrances. By the way, there's a waterfall in the back. Go check it out. All of the, and they're giving you a full tour of your palaces and you're being greeted like a tour guide. Angels are your tour guides in Jannah. And when you go to an expensive place, when you go to like, you know, sometimes hotels look like palaces. You go spend how many nights in a hotel? One, two, it's expensive. And then you realize I'm going to leave here, but I should take some pictures before I go. It was nice. It was a nice or you go to some beautiful island or beautiful resort, vacation place. How long can you stay there? Just a little bit. You're being given this beautiful tour. Allah says, Khalidina fiha. They're gonna stay here. It's not temporary. This is your home now. This is where you live. Hasunat mustaqarran wa muqaman. This is such an awesome place to be temporarily and long term. Now the question comes, how come Allah mentioned, I understand Jannah, He mentioned long term. Why did He mention what? Temporarily. Short term. Why did he mention mustaqar? Hasunat mustaqarran wa muqaman. Afham muqaman. Al khulud fil jannah. Falimad al mustaqar. Because, because, if you make it to one level of jannah, Allah Azza wa Jal is giving you the option. It might be that He might upgrade you to the executive suite. Next level of jannah. So this home you have in jannah, as awesome as it is, might be temporary because Allah is about to upgrade you. And then you go, you go to the upgrade and it might be that Allah is again about to upgrade you again. And so there's an open, there's a door open in this ayah for Muslims. Maybe we make it, Jannah has seven levels, you make it to level one. Maybe the basement of level one you made it. But Allah is offering you over time, mustaqar, I'll give you even more, temp, more above and above and above. I'll keep giving you better, subhanallah. Subhanallah, it's, it's awesome. One of the descriptions of Jannah in the, uh, in the Quran we find is مَا كِثِينَ فِيهِ abada. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah says مَا كِثِينَ فِيهِ abada. مَا كِث in Arabic means someone who's waiting for something and they're excited. Musa alayhi salam told his family, wait here. I'm gonna go see about that fire. Umkuthu. لَا إِنْتَظِرُوا أُمْكُثُوا إِنِّي أَنَسْتُ nara. You stay here. When they're staying there, are they waiting excitedly? Like, can't, I can't wait till he comes back? Or they're like, yeah, might as well stay here. No, they're nervous, they're excited because they're waiting for the next thing. Allah says in Quran, we will constantly be waiting in Jannah in excitement. You know what that means? Allah will give you fruit and you'll eat it. You're like, oh, that was amazing. And then you're excited because the next delivery is coming. Then Allah will show you a palace and you're so happy. But then you're excited because the next palace is about to be shown. You're constantly going to be upgraded and this is going to happen forever. Forever. You can't go beyond iPhone 5, guys. You have to wait. You have to make lots of dua for 6. <laughs> you know? You got the Samsung, whatever. 
that's it. There's, you have to wait till the upgrade. But you, in, a, in Quran, everything about Jannah will be upgraded and upgraded permanently, permanently, permanently. You keep moving up. This is Hasunat Mustaqarran wa Muqamah. I shared these ayat with you because I want to encourage you and your families to be Ibadur Rahman. Allah did not tell us you have to do all of this. He said, at least do one of these. Give me one of these so I have a reason to call you Ibadur Rahman. Give Allah a reason to be called Ibadur Rahman. Give Allah a reason. You know? He is so loving and kind that he, he instead of setting higher requirements, he lowers the requirements. He keeps. Okay, you, don't, you can't do that one? How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? SubhanAllah. In so many He gave us. May Allah Azza wa Jal truly make us Ibadul Rahman. And may Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, put barakah in this community, in the lives of the Muslims here. May Allah Azza wa Jal make for all of you and your wives and your children, for the sisters, the brothers, the elders, the young, for all of them learning Quran easy, learning the seerah of Rasulullah Sallallahu easy. You know, memorizing Quran easy, understanding the language of the Quran easy, and make dua that you guys are the reason that the Arabic language is revived in the Khalij. That you guys speak Arabic so well and so purely and so refined, there's not even a single bit of Amiya in it. You get so good at Arabic that Arabic itself gets revived by these foreigners that are sitting here. I want to be part of that plan. I want to make you guys into Arabs sooner or later. Inshallah ta'ala. I'm, I'm, in, I'm inspired. I think there's a real potential in the, at least the, the Muslim community that speaks English. There's a very easy way. All of you can learn very, very good Arabic, the language of the Quran, connect directly with the Quran and speak the language of our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, one of the reasons we should desire to learn Arabic is not just to understand the Quran, but because these words and these, this language came out of the love of our, the, the words of our Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That should be enough for me to want to speak it. That should be enough, you know. It's just out of his love I want to speak this language. And if you're going to learn this language, don't just learn it to order a shawarma. <laughs> learn it properly, so you, you taste it. You, you know, you really get engrossed in it and you see its beauty. Allah gave this ummah a gift. You and I are from different ethnicities. We're from different ethnicities. But the one thing we have in common is the Qur'an. Well, Qur'an wa Arabi. Quran is Arabic. You know, Ar-Rasul Arabi, the Rasul is an Arab. Allah made the Arabic language universal. Turkish is for the Turks. French is for the French. Urdu is for the Pakistani Indians. Punjabi is for the Punjabis. Bangla is for the Bangladeshis. But Arabic is for the Muslim. Arabic is not for one nation. It's not for one ethnicity. It's not for one, it's for the Muslim. Every Muslim, I don't care if you're French or German or Italian or Spanish or Pakistani, Bangladeshi, even Punjabi, I'll take it. I'll take it. You can learn Arabic and you will and you will be awesome at it. You have to believe that. Allah will make that easy for you. If your intention is you want to get closer to Allah's word, then Allah will open doors for you you could not have even imagined. You could not have imagined. I want you guys to at least take first steps in Arabic. How many people here can read Quran, but they don't understand it? You can read it, but you don't understand it. It's the vast majority of you. If you're in this state, I used to be like you in 1999. In 1999, I read Quran, but I didn't understand what I was reading. I took a class for three weeks. I began to understand what I was reading. I kept doing about half an hour of study a day. I've never studied Arabic full time in my life, never. I've only studied Arabic and Qur'an part-time. I made it a part of my life. And I'm still a student of the Qur'an and I'm still a student of the Arabic language. That's what I want for Muslims. You don't have to stop your life to learn this language. You just need 20 minutes a day. You just need 30 minutes a day. I want to be able to give you that plan. I want to give you that plan. You run with it. I gave you yesterday Bayina.tv. Yes? On it, some of you are already students on it. There are, there's a pro, I, I started teaching my own daughter, my 12 year old daughter, 11 year old daughter, I started teaching her some Arabic of the Quran. How to understand Arabic of the Quran. 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day. And she's not a super genius. She makes a lot of mistakes and forgets things and gets in trouble and all of that. But I decided to record every session as I teach her. Because I figure if I can teach her, a 10 year old, and you can learn, your kids can learn, your wife can learn, you can, you can all learn. And if you can stay with it, you can begin to understand the Qur'an. 
It's just 20 minutes, 15 minutes a day for maybe three, four days a week. Not much. You can do that. You don't have to change your lifestyle in order to do this. So I want you to try to use it. It's called Arabic with Husna. Look it up. Google it even, you'll find it. Arabic with Husna. You know, it's, it's on Bayina TV, the website I gave you yesterday. In, in, in Ramadan, I don't want you to study Arabic. I want you to study Quran. But after that, just little by little by little, start learning some Arabic. You are blessed to be in the Khadij. You're blessed to be in like a country like Qatar. There are so many ulama here and so many durus here and you're missing out because they're all in Arabic. I, mean, I think you can get there in a year. Within a year, you should be sitting in those halaqat and you should be like, ah, I get what he's saying. I understand. Why not? Absolutely you can do it. Inshallah ta'ala. So that's, that's the hope and the, the prayer I have. I want all of you to sincerely please make dua for myself, my colleagues, my teachers, and also my family. Especially make dua that the projects we have, the project I personally have, I think that we, we, we did something pretty interesting in America. You know, we, we started this experiment of teaching Arabic in America, and subhanAllah, we've seen amazing results. Students are speaking Arabic fluently, they're joining, you know, Islamic universities in other countries, you know, after meeting the Arabic requirements from us. People are shocked that they're learning Arabic in, our, in America of all places. We think we're, we've reached a pretty successful curriculum. Now the job is to make that curriculum available to the entire Ummah. So the entire Ummah can learn Arabic. The entire Ummah can begin to understand Qur'an. So make dua for our project. And make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, helps the Muslims learn through it and improve and keep the sincerity going for all of us in Bidhinah Ta'ala. That is the sincere request I have from all of you inshallah Ta'ala. It's really, it's been an awesome, awesome trip for me. It really has been. And one of the things that, you know, it, it, I have to say to you is, you know, we live in different countries and different continents. We're separated by oceans. But wallahi, when you come to you know, a Muslim country, and you see all the faces you see, majority of them are people of La ilaha illallah. You get a new love for the Ummah. You just get a new love for the Ummah. You know? Like everyone here is someone I hope to see. And I don't get to know you today, but we're gonna have a lot of time in Jannah. <laughs> we're gonna have a lot of time to hang out. You know? That's it. I say, these are the people I wanna meet in Jannah. I wanna get to know every one of them. And then we look back and say, remember that program? You were there? Yeah, you were there? Oh wow, yeah that was pretty cool. And we can request, is there a recording available in Jannah for this program, can we have that? And the angels might play a recording for us, like yeah, that was pretty cool. You know, I wanna do that. I wanna, and it just really, I, I'm more inspired to see more and more of the Muslim world, because I think it just, there's this love that needs to be there in the Ummah. It's missing man, it's missing. Show love to each other. When you go to the masjid and pray, make a friend. Don't just grab your slippers and climb over the next guy and grab your shoes and go. Say salam to someone. Salam alaikum, how are you? How's it going? Etc. Just make a friend. And even if they're weird, like they don't say wa alaikum salam, it's okay. It's okay. Find the next guy. Make, get to know people. Become social. And the masjid is the place to do that. People who come to the masjid are people who want to get close to Allah. That's the best kind of friend you can have. Right? But make friends at the masjid. Get to know people at the masjid. And sisters, it's halal for you to do that too. You can make other friends with other sisters here. When you come to make salah, don't just give sisters the look of death that I talked about before. You can also turn it off a little bit and talk and have a normal conversation and make some friends. This is how the ummah get bonds. This is how the ummah comes closer and closer and closer. This is how we stop killing the... We, how, this is how we can kill nationalism and tribalism and racism. We can kill these things by putting a love of Allah. There's a barakah in the house of Allah. Take advantage of that. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal helps all of you do that. I make lots of dua for the future of this community, the present of this community. May Allah protect you from all kinds of fitnas. May Allah Azza wa Jal make you stronger and stronger in your iman. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect not only your deen, but also your dunya in, in, you know, in this part of the world. May Allah put barakah in all of your rizq. May Allah Azza wa Jal make you people of sadaqah. May Allah make you an example for other Muslims to follow. May Allah Azza wa Jal help you create services for the ummah that don't just benefit your own people, they benefit people all over the world. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless those and reward those who work so hard to make this program happen and so many programs like this happen. 
I know we on our end are very difficult to deal with. So they were very patient with us and they were, really went out of their way to take care of us. And the hospitality I felt here is unbelievable. I've never felt that kind of hospitality anywhere ever before. So I'm very, very grateful to the brothers and maybe even the sisters that were involved in putting this together, the institutions. I'm very grateful to Fanar for the opportunity. Alhamdulillah, I'm very honored that I got to be here and I met some of the faculty and the administration and the director. MashaAllah, it's a great bunch of people. Make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal puts even more like enthusiasm in their hearts so they let you know they let even more programs like this happen over and over again inshallah ta'ala but I, i'm personally i'm leaving with a very optimistic heart i'm leaving inshallah ta'ala tomorrow and I'll, I'll be making dua for you as i travel but i'm 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 telling you i feel good about what i see i know there are problems but there are far more opportunities than problems really and the, the opportunities here excite me they're really, really exciting. So inshallah, maybe in the future you'll see more of me here. Inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu wa lakum. Thank you so very much for listening tonight. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.